Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to our Sunday morning service here at Bethel. A little rain outside, but it, it could be worse. I guess it could be snow. If you who love the snow, uh, well, whatever. <laughs> I don't like the snow. Let's all stand as we start a worship service today. Uh, dwelling in Beulah Land, that place of victory in our, in our uh, walk with Christ. for the truth of that song when we're walking in your obedience we're doing your will we're in the center of your will we truly are living in Beulah land father thank you for the truth of your word that when we surrender to your will your blessings will flow and father we thank you for the truth father now we pray for your blessings as we continue to sing songs of praise and victory we have in you 
And as always, when Pastor Kelly comes up, we pray that you use the message to draw us close to you. And if there's somebody here or somebody watching by live stream that does not know Christ as Savior, we pray today will be the day they say yes to Christ. We pray for your continued blessings now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. To have a successful walk with Jesus Christ, we need just to do two things. Trust and obey. Amen. Let's say. As you make your way back to seat, you all may be seated. We just have one more song. This next song is called Come and Dine. Anybody know where that's found in the scripture, that little phrase, come and dine? 
I'll help you out. John chapter 21. Remember after the resurrection of Christ, Peter went back to fishing. The Lord Jesus was on the seashore asking them if they caught anything. But yet he yells back, come and dine. He had fish and bread prepared for them. And I know someday that we have our, the great marriage feast of the Lamb, supper of the Lamb. And someday we'll, in glory, we'll be sitting with the Lord Jesus and dining with him. But do you know that we can still come and dine with him now? Every time you open up God's word, that's Jesus say, come and dine. It's supper time. Every time, every time you open God's word, the Lord Jesus wants to feed us. So take advantage of, your, of the Bible you have at home. You should be reading it daily. If not, you're not going to have the joy that you should have as a Christian. And I was, I was just recently talking to someone, actually a family member just recently, and they were telling me they don't have that joy. But then they told me they have not been reading their Bible lately either. So it's, it's a comparison. I mean, a court, one goes with the other. To have joy, you must be in God's word. So come and dine is the name of this song. It's an old uh, bluegrass country. But the truth is there. Jesus has the table spread where the saints of God are fed. He invites his chosen people come and dine. With his manna he does feed and supplies our every need. Oh, it's sweet to sup with Jesus all the time. Master calleth, come and dine. He may feast at Jesus' table all the time. He who fed the multitude turned the water into wine. To the hungry calleth now, come and dine. The disciples came to Land, thus obeying Christ's command, for the Master calleth them to come and dine. There they found their heart's desire, bread and fish upon the fire. Thus he satisfies the hungry every time. Come and dine, the Master calleth, come and dine. Feast at Jesus' table all the time. He who fed the potent to turn the water into wine. To the hungry now come and dine on the last. Soon the Lamb will take his bride to be ever by his side. All the host of heaven will assemble be. Both will be a glorious sight. All the saints in spotless white. And with Jesus they will feast eternally. Amen. Come and dine, the master called it. Come and dine. He may feast at It's a fitting song considering we're going to talk about food this morning and how to have leftovers, so that's good. But it's great to see you this morning. Trust that you have had a great week. Praise the Lord, it's raining and not snowing today. Can you believe we're almost through January? And we have had, really, for January, we have had wonderful weather. About that. But uh, God is good, isn't he? Amen. Amen. And uh, if you were praying for Sharon, she made it through her surgery okay, and all went well there. 
And uh, Tony's dad uh, had surgery on Friday as well, had a couple of toes amputated, but uh, doing okay uh, from there. And so we can rejoice in the Lord for that. But uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we come before you today and we thank you that uh, you do invite us to come and dine, to feast at your table, to feast upon your word. Thank you, Father, we do anticipate that marriage supper of the Lamb where we're going to be able to sit with you and feast with you there in glory. And Lord, until then, may you help us to trust and obey and follow you and truly live that day-to-day life in Beulah land. And Father, today we uh, ask that you'll give Sharon complete healing now from the surgery that she had. Also for Tony's dad, that you'll continue to give him healing and strength and continue to give his doctors wisdom. We lift up Diane, a friend to you today who's having some health issues, uh, for Patricia Morris having surgery this week, and uh, for a lady by the name of Gina that uh, lost a son, we ask that you would minister to her today as well. We ask that you continue to be with Irene's family as she went home to be with the Lord this week. Pray that you'll give them comfort uh, and encouragement And uh, Lord, we just ask your continued blessings on the service this morning as we worship you now as our provider. Thank you for being such a good, good father. And we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Not going to have any special this morning. And so if you've got something you'd like to thank or praise the Lord for this morning, just slip your hand up so we can see who you are and we can uh, let you give the Lord some thanks today. James? Yeah, because it's not many that want to hug you, so that's really awesome. (laughs) So that's good. That's good. Anybody else Some you want to give the Lord some thanks or praise for today? Not everybody at once. Sandy? Somebody else. Mark? Amen. Awesome. Awesome. Good. Anybody else? Something you want to thank the Lord for? Len? Somebody else. Carol? Amen. Yes. Amen. Somebody else. Sally? Amen. Awesome. Praise the Lord. Sally had a birthday this week. Uh, 29. Uh, (laughs) Sherry? Amen. Awesome. Good. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Wilbur. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Anybody else? Crystal? Amen. Amen. We need to keep Jim in prayer as well. He had a biopsy done this week, so we need to lift the Lord up and uh, for that, or lift Jim up to the Lord. Uh, for that. Anybody else? Something you want to thank him for? James? Amen. Yes. Amen. And our crew made it down to Alabama, so praise the Lord, they made it there safe, and uh, they'll be heading back on the road on Tuesday morning come back home so we certainly need to lift them up in prayer as they travel back home as well anybody else something you want to thank the lord for today bobby ann amen awesome there's a hand down here in the front tim Awesome. 
We had a good teen activity Friday night as well. We had about 15 teenagers out for that, and one that hasn't been out for a while was out, and so praise the Lord for that too. And so God is good, isn't he? Amen. Amen. And how often is God good? All the time. That's exactly right. Even when it doesn't seem like he's good, he's still good. That's the truth. Well, we want to talk about how to have leftovers from John chapter 6. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there and we'll get there eventually. But now I understand there are some folks who don't like to eat leftovers. And I need to, this is on. turned on. There we go. I didn't touch it. I just saw the green light and thought we were good to go. And so, so let me start all over again. I know there are some folks who don't like leftovers, and that's okay. Is there any, any of you, you say, I don't like leftovers. Just slip your hand up. It's okay. I promise we won't judge you. Anybody at all? So it looks like Tiffany, Tiffany you don't like leftovers. Well, we'll judge you. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> some don't. That's all right. But I've got to confess to you that in my house, we like leftovers. And uh, I just confess that to you this morning. And we not only like them, but we eat them quite often. And uh, we either eat them for lunch, uh, or we eat them for dinner the next day, or the next day, and the next day, depending on how, much, how many leftovers there are. But, uh, but have you ever noticed it seems like some foods are better the second time around? What are some of those foods that you could think of? Spaghetti. Spaghetti, that's on my list. It just, whatever it is, seems like that sauce sits in the fridge and just gets better as the weeks go by. Maybe not weeks, but uh, Mark? Chili. Chili, yes, another one where it just, the flavor just seems to absorb in. Katie? Meatloaf. Meatloaf. Sandy? Cabbage. Cabbage, oh, Wow. What is what are we doing talking about food all these weeks? It's it's just crazy. Crystal? Uh, beef stew. Beef stew. Any kind of those things. It just seems like the flavors just get better and better the longer they're left in the refrigerator. Any other leftovers you think of get better, Tamara? Lasagna, and that was on my list too. Carol? Chicken soup. Chicken soup. All right. Any others you think of? Man, just the longer they sit, the better they seem to be. Gene? The pizza, yes. You know, pizza the next morning for breakfast tastes better than it did the night before. Absolutely. Sandy? Ham and bean bean soup. Yeah, because that ham, the flavors just seem to mold together a whole lot better. This past week, I had potatoes, uh, leftover potatoes for lunch. I had leftover spaghetti for lunch. I had leftover pork loin for lunch. And I actually had leftover salmon cakes for a snack Tuesday night. And so when it comes to leftovers, listen, I'm all about them. Now do me this favor. I don't want you to go home and find all those things that's been in your fridge for two or three weeks and bring them to me thinking I really like them that much, all right? But uh, there's nothing like leftover meatloaf to make a meatloaf sandwich. You slice that meatloaf down nice, just, just the right thickness, and then put a slice of Swiss cheese on top of it and pop it in the microwave to warm it up a little bit and then smother it with mayo, and man, there's nothing like it. And so just really good stuff. And so what are some of your favorite leftovers? Anybody have favorite leftovers? I know we talked about the ones that seem to get better, but what are your favorites, James? James? Now that's interesting. You make a grilled spaghetti sandwich. That's interesting. I'll have to try that. I won't knock it till I try it. Anybody else? What is your favorite leftover if you like them? That's it. Just James. Sandy? Thanksgiving dinner. Thanksgiving. Oh, I didn't even think about that. The cream turkey and biscuits afterwards? Wow. Katie, your favorite leftover? Chili? Anybody else? You got a favorite leftover, Marge? 
vegetable soup. Amen. Awesome. Good stuff. Good food. So we want to talk about uh, how to have leftovers this morning. John chapter 6, the setting to our text, if you're there, John chapter 6, verses 1 to 4, we, we kind of get the background, we get the setting of what's happening in the ministry of Jesus. Uh, the Bible says this in John chapter 6. It says, after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples, and the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. Father, today, as we discover this text and some truths from it about how to have leftovers, uh, God, I pray today that you would stir us and you would challenge us, and we'll give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. So kind of get the picture in your mind this morning. Jesus has been ministering. He's been healing people. And uh, in an attempt to get away from the large crowd, the Bible says he crosses the Sea of Galilee, also known as Tiberias. And there, as he crosses the sea, he ascends up into a mountain with his disciples. Now, the crowd had been watching Jesus heal people, person after person, probably being healed, and they're watching it, and they're probably captivated by what they are seeing with their eyes, and there's probably others in the crowd that still are hoping they can get close enough to Jesus or get their child close enough to Jesus to, to be healed, and so that great multitude had been following him, just watching him, and where he would go, they would go moving from place to place. And perhaps they were following because they didn't want to miss the next big healing. And so it's in that setting, as Jesus now tries to escape that multitude, and he's on a mountain, that we discover what it takes to have leftovers. And so the first thought is this this morning. If you want to have leftovers, there's got to be a recognition of the need. John chapter 6, and the first part of verse 5 says this, sitting up on the mountain with his disciples, when Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him. And so here they are, they're on the mountain. Jesus sees this multitude of people coming to him. In fact, that multitude of people we're going to find out in, later on in the text is about 5,000 men. And so we're not talking about a little group of people. We're talking about a few thousand people that are now approaching Jesus, following him, even though he tried to get away from the multitude in a sense. But picture in your mind, they're on the mountain. They can see everything down below them and everyone down below them. Perhaps Jesus is talking with his disciples about the events of the day, who got healed, how it happened, what the diseases were. Perhaps they were talking about what they were going to eat because they had been busy all day long dealing with people. And as Jesus is talking with the disciples, he lifts up his head and he sees this multitude of people coming towards him. Now, let's be really honest this morning. I want you to imagine with me, and as best as you can, you have just put in a hard day of work. You've worked, for some, that might equate to four hours, some six, some eight, some ten, some twelve. You've put in a hard day of work. You just got home, you've chatted with your wife a little bit, you, you, you chatted with the kids, and you've given them the hugs and the kisses and all those things you do. And you're just settling in and getting ready to perhaps sit down at the table and you hear a noise outside. And you get up and you crack the blinds open and you see there's about 20 or 30 people coming toward your house. And as you spy out those 20 or 30 people, you know they want something from you. What's going to go through your mind at that moment? Anybody? Sandy? What am I going to feed them? Len, did you say something? Get to the basement. Get to the basement. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Anybody else? What's going through your mind? Bill? Find out what they want. Find out what they want. Anybody else? 
Tell them you're not home, so we're going to close the blind back down nice and slow, make sure there's no music on, the TV's off, you tell the kids to be quiet. Anybody else? What's going to go through your mind? Sick the dog. Let the dog out. Yes, absolutely. And that's actually on my iPad. Let the dogs out. <laughs> and so within our text, that's kind of the scenario that's happening. Jesus lifts up his eyes, and here comes this few thousand people, approximately 5,000 men, and so there could be women and children inside, included in that crowd. And his initial response is not, come on, man, I'm tired. I've been dealing with you people all day long, and you can't even let me get away for a little bit. I'll see you tomorrow. Tell them I'm off the clock. That's not what Jesus does. Look back in verse 5. He saith unto Philip, and go ahead and read that next line out loud. That was Bill's response, kind of. What do they want? So here they are. The first response of Jesus is not, let's preach to them. That'd be a typical Baptist response, wouldn't it? But rather, let's feed them. They've been at it all day long. They got away, thinking they were going to get away. And yet when Jesus sees them coming, he says, let's feed them. Now again, remember, this crowd has likely been hanging out with Jesus all day long. They had been likely following him from place to place, person to person, watching him heal disease after disease. And so it's very possible that this crowd hasn't eaten all day long. All they were concerned about was Jesus. They were consumed with Jesus. So let me ask you this. When was the last time you got so into Jesus that you forgot about eating? It's been a while, probably. You're probably already thinking now what you're going to eat when the service is over. So consumed and into Jesus that you weren't worried about eating. That's the way this crowd obviously was. And Jesus recognizes it, and he wants to do something about it. Imagine what kind of crowd we'd have in a couple of weeks at the love banquet if we didn't have any food. Probably have a lot smaller crowd. And yet here's the crowd following Jesus. He knows they're hungry and he wants to do something about it. Now apart from phys physical food, there is a greater need to see today. And that is the need for spiritual food. That is the need for the Word of God in people's lives. That's the song we talked about, sang this morning, Come and Dine. Jesus invited them to eat physical food, but the spiritual food is of greater importance. You see, we can feed people physical food all day long, but that's not going to get them any closer to heaven. It's not going to get them into heaven. We can clothe people all day, but clothing them is not going to get them into heaven. We must give them the bread of life, Jesus Christ. The real need of the day is not to take care of people's physical needs, but to take care of their spiritual needs. Not to share physical bread, but to share the bread of life. That's the real need of the day. Every year, as many of you know, we have uh, in the month of October, we have Missions Month. We bring in a missionary every week or a speaker every week. And the purpose of that is not just to bring the missionaries in to give them a break and encourage them, but, but it's really to bring them in so that we might see the need of reaching the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus said, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. He was talking about seeing the spiritual need of the world. And so this weekend, uh, Keith and Cody and Brett and then uh, Leonard are down at Ira's, one of our missionaries in Alabama, installing a large electrical panel <clears throat> for Ira's camp. 
and they're also going to seal a concrete floor. Uh, that's if Brett doesn't get fired while he's down there. That's an inside joke. If you remember, Brett said the worst job in the world would be working for Keith. But anyway, those guys aren't down there because they needed something extra to do this weekend. They're there because they see the need of helping Ira reach black America with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then next month, Jim Wheatley and hopefully Jeremy and myself are going back down to Ira's to spend a week to help him do some other work on one of the buildings. And that's not because Vicki and Tamara and Debbie need a break. Well, at least Vicki and Tamara... It's not because they need a break from us, but it's because we see the need and we want to do something to help meet that need. And by the way, there's still room for one more man to join us. If you're interested in taking a week to do that, see me after the service this morning. But truth is this, the need of reaching the world with the gospel is a great need. Reaching people for Jesus is is a great need. Do you believe that this morning? About three of you believe it. The rest of you still need to recognize that need, the need of reaching the world. Tuesday, Tony had messaged me about her dad's physical condition. So I responded with a text and said, I'd like to go to the hospital tonight with Cody to visit your dad. And it all worked out that I followed her and Cody up to the hospital on Tuesday. And I wasn't going just to say hi. I was going with the intent of sharing Jesus with Tony's dad. And uh, Tony sent me a text that day. He said, just so you know, my dad has been a Catholic for the last 30 years. I was like, that's okay. God can take care of that. And so I followed her and Cody up to Ruby on Tuesday and got there and uh, they would only let two people in the room at a time. And so Tony and I went up into the room and uh, she said something like, I bought pastor with me. And he, he said something like, oh, you bought the big gun. You know, and I'm no bigger than anybody else. We're all equal in God's eyes. But he said something like that as if to say, I'm in trouble now. You know, uh, Joe, how many of you remember Joe Brandt? Anybody remember Joe? Joe's theory was this. He said, people would complain about the pastor never coming to their house. He said, if the pastor's not going to, coming to my house, at least I know I'm not in trouble. And so we sat down and we started talking a little bit and started talking some small talk. And he started talking about whether or not he was going to see his next birthday. And so that gave me the open door just to say, hey, well, if you don't, See your next birthday. Do you know where you're going to spend eternity? And he said, well, I hope heaven. I said, well, if you could know, would you want to know? And he said, well, absolutely. So I sat there at his bedside and I shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with him. And I said, would you like to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior? He said, yes, I would. Trusted Christ as a Savior. He was ready to be saved. I mean, that's just the reality. Tony and, and Cody have been working on him for a few years. So they, just, they did all the work. I just went in and, and uh, took care of it from there. But afterwards, with tears in his eyes, he said, I have heard those words before, but I never understood them. Tonight, I understood them. See, we've got to see the need that people need Jesus. We've got to see it. We've got to see the need for the gospel in people's lives right here where we are and around the world. But not only see the need, we've got to do something about the need. We've got to share people. We've got to share Jesus with people. We've got to support missionaries who are going to places that we can't go. Somebody once said, see a need. Can anybody finish that? Fill a need. Meet the need. See a need, meet the need. And so when you see the need for someone that needs the gospel, our response should be, I'm going to fill that need. I'm going to meet that need, and I am going to share Jesus Christ with them. 
And so before we can have leftovers, we must see the need. Jesus saw the need and he pointed it out to his disciples. The second thing we've got to realize is we've got to recognize our inabilities to meet the need. Verses 6 through 9 of John chapter 6. And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. So Jesus said, hey, what are we going to do? Philip says, well, in verse 7, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? So Jesus sees the crowd coming. He says, what are we going to do? How are we going to feed them? Philip responds and says, well, here's the bottom line, Jesus. We don't have enough to feed them all. We have this much money. If we were to take all this money and go buy bread, it still wouldn't do the job. Then Andrew speaks up and says, hey, we've got a little boy here. He's got five barley loaves and two small fishes. But then Andrew says, that's not going to cut it either. Now, bread from barley, so barley loaves, were considered inferior to other breads of that day. And it was usually made in families of the lower class. And then did you notice the emphasis about the fish? Andrew didn't just say two fish. He said two small fish. Lord, we've got five barley loaves and we've got two small fish. That's all we have. All we got is this poor boy's lunch. And what is the lunch of a poor boy going to accomplish with such a large crowd? We don't have what it's going to take, Jesus. We're unable to do it. Now here's the truth of the matter this morning. We do not personally have what it takes to meet the need of reaching the world in and of ourselves with the gospel. And we certainly don't have the resources that it takes to reach the world with the gospel. And truth is, last year and this year, our commitments to missions are higher than what our actual missions giving is. And so we don't have the resources. We've got to recognize if we want to have leftovers, we have to come to this conclusion. I don't have what it takes to get the job done. But just because we don't have the ability doesn't mean we throw our hands up in the air and do nothing. If we want to have leftovers, we not only need to recognize our inabilities, but we do need to make available what we do have. And that's verses 10 and 11. Jesus, after hearing Philip say what he said, and after hearing Andrew say what he said, here's Jesus' response. And Jesus said, make the men to sit down. Sit them down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. You could just kind of imagine Philip and Andrew and the other disciples. Okay, we told Jesus where we're at. We don't have what it takes, and yet he's telling us to tell them to sit down. In the back of their minds, they've got to be wondering, what's he going to do? Verse 11, And Jesus took the loaves... And when he had, what's the next two words? He distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down. And likewise of the fishes. And what's the last phrase? As much as they would. The disciples knew what they had was not enough. And yet when Jesus said, sit them down, they sat them down. Listen, when Jesus talks, you listen. Amen? Remember the old TV commercial when E.F. Hutton talks? People listen. When Jesus talks, you listen. 
and you obey. So they set him down. <clears throat> now again, let's be honest this morning. If you was one of those disciples, say you were Philip and you were Andrew, you're the guy that said, Jesus, we don't have enough money to go buy bread to feed him. Or you were Andrew that said, we got this little poor boy's lunch, but what is that? Jesus says to you, sit him down. What's going to go through your mind? I, I heard, but I didn't make out what it was. I better get them seated. I better get them seated. Okay. What else is going to go through your mind? What's he going to do next? What's he going to do next? Anybody else? Well, let's just be real honest this morning. What's he going to do? We don't have enough to feed 50, let alone 5,000. What in the world is this guy thinking? I mean, I know he can heal the sick and raise the dead and all those things. What is going through their minds? And they all get seated. Jesus takes those five barley loaves, and they were small loaves. The Bible says he blessed it, and he gave it to the disciples. Now, you're one of those disciples, and Jesus hands you a loaf of bread. And you're looking at a crowd of near 5,000 men. What's going through your mind as you're holding one of those small barley loaves or maybe a half a loaf? What's going through your mind at that point? <laughs> who gets it and who doesn't get it? And here's the bottom line. Only so many are going to get it and the rest are probably going to be mad at me and I might end up dead. So they get those loaves or half a loaf. I'm going to make the assumption, and it could be wrong. He took those five loaves, and he split them up between the 12 disciples. So what do they all get? Not even a half a loaf each. And he gives it to them. And they walk out into the crowd. Can you imagine what's going through their mind? And they take that piece of barley loaf, and they break it off, and they give it. And then they look down, and they say, can't see where it broke off at. And they break it again, and they give it. And they look down, and I still can't see where those two chunks were taken off at. Can you imagine the excitement that had to be building as every time they broke that bread off and it never ran out? Was it growing in their hand? I don't know, but I'll know this. Out of those five barley loaves, they fed nearly 5,000 men. I don't know about you, but if I was that way after the second or third or fourth time, I'd be like, man, make it a bigger piece. You want the whole loaf? I'll give it to you because something's going to happen in my hand. What an exciting thing it had to be for those disciples to see that take place. It's incredible. Give them as much as they want. And it wasn't about giving them something to hold them over until they got home. It was give them as much as they want. And then he took the fish and he did the same exact thing. Now, wait a minute. He only started with two small fish. Can you imagine opening a can of sardines? And I don't know how small it was, but it says it was small. So let's open a can of sardines and there's two sardines in it. Jesus takes those two sardines and we're going to assume that he blesses them as he blesses the bread and he gives it to the disciples. Two sardines split 12 ways isn't a very big chunk of fish. Somebody's bound to get the tail. And the same thing begins to happen. And they feed all those people. I want you to know this morning, while we have the inability to meet the need, God has the ability to meet it. But here's what we have to do. We have to make available to him what we do have, and then he'll take care of it from there. I love what the Bible says. I love this story. It's absolutely 
incredible. We don't have enough. And yet, there was enough. You know, there are some that think, man, I cannot afford to give like the Bible teaches. And I can't afford to give to missions. And truth is this. Not a one of us in this room can afford it. However, what many in this room have discovered is when you trust and obey the Lord, you discover God supplies the need. But until you surrender what you do have to give to God, you will never know see or understand just what God can do. And so let's check out the leftovers, verses 12 and 13. Read that first line up to the comma. When they were what? Filled. Now let me ask you this. When you sit down at the table... And you get up and you're still hungry. Are you filled? No. When you get up from the table and you say you are filled, what does that mean to you? Can't eat anymore. If you're a Baptist, it probably means you ate more than you should have. When they were filled, not when they got enough just to hold them over till they make it home. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. The little boy made his lunch available. The disciples made themselves available to feed the multitude. And after everyone has eaten and were filled, that means they had all they wanted. After 5,000 men were fed and filled. Now, how many loaves did they start with? Five. Who did those five loaves belong to? One boy. How many fish did they start with? Two. Who did they belong to? One boy. So one little boy shows up with his own lunch. We don't know if it was in a brown bag or if it was in a basket or if it was rolled up in a piece of paper. But what we do know is one boy showed up with one lunch. This boy was not carrying 12 baskets. He was carrying one lunch. And Jesus said, okay, men, dinner is over. It's time to clean up. Let's gather all the fragments Fragments that remain, and let's not leave nothing behind. Now, let's face it. It was a miracle alone to feed nearly 5,000 with the amount of food they had. But if that wasn't enough, what started out as one boy's lunch, what started out with five loaves and two small fishes, ended up with how many baskets left over? Twelve. Taking the scripture of face value, that's 12 baskets of bread. It doesn't appear there was any fish left over. Could have been, but it doesn't appear so. But 12 baskets of leftovers. Now, how many disciples were there? 12. How many baskets? A group of guys that said, we don't have enough now have their own lunch basket. That's pretty cool if you ask me. All because 
a need was seen, the inability was admitted to, and somebody surrendered what they had, and a miracle took place. I love what Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10 says. I put it up on the wall. It says, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven. And what's the next phrase? And pour you out a blessing. Now, he doesn't stop there. What's the last phrase? I understand some of you may not have been able to see it. But he says, you bring it. And see if I don't give you a blessing. I'll open the windows of heaven. I like he says windows, Amen. I'll open the windows of heaven, plural, and pour you out a blessing, and I love this, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. We could say this. He said he'll open the windows of heaven and he'll give you 12 basketfuls at the end of the day, so to speak. Now understand, God keeps his promises. He keeps them his way and in his time. And we will never experience the windows of heaven being opened until we're willing to do the first part. And then he said, Jesus said in Luke 6, 38, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. That's like saying God's shovel is bigger than your shovel. And it is when you give with the right heart. If you simply give to get, it's the wrong attitude. We give simply because God says to do it. Then we trust God from there. Now, I don't know about you, but I enjoy the God-sized leftovers. But you know, the truth is, the best is yet to come. Because some of those leftovers won't be seen until eternity. And then watch what happens after that. There's a strengthened faith in verse 14. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, this is of a truth, that prophet, that should come into the world. Their faith was strengthened. Their belief in who Jesus was was strengthened. This is really that prophet that should come. And I want you to know this morning, when, when you obey God and you surrender and give as the scripture teaches, it is then your faith will be strengthened. And it is then you will begin to see that God really does keep his promises. So let's land this plane and give you a couple of applications this morning. If you want to experience God-sized leftovers in your life, you got to see the need. And the need today is not for physical food, but for spiritual. And that need is right here where we live, as well as around the world. See that need this morning. Recognize your inability to meet the need on your own. You can't do it, and I can't do it. And then make available what you do have to meet that need. Just make it available. Now, it's more than just saying, God, here's my heart, here's my checkbook. Or I'm sorry, it's more than just, God, here's my wallet, here's my checkbook. It really starts by saying, God, here's my heart. And not just for salvation, but God, here's my heart, I give it all to you. God, here's my life, I give it all to you. My life is your life. What I have, you have. God, I make it available to you. It's not much. It's just a couple of barley loaves and a couple of small fishes. God, it's not much, but I make it available to you today. It's yours, God. 
And I'll use it how you see fit. I'll use it as your word directs. And as you do that, you will begin to discover God working in ways that you didn't realize he could work because you started obeying him. And many of you this morning can testify to that fact. God knows this morning what we have and what we don't have. The issue isn't what we have or don't have. The issue is what are we doing with what we have. And as we surrender it to God and begin to follow Him, it's then we'll begin to see God meet our needs in a new and exciting way. He may not increase our income, but we will see Him provide and supply with leftovers. And that will result in our faith being strengthened. So let me ask you this morning, and you answer it in your own heart. Do you see the need for reaching the world with the gospel? Do you realize you can't meet it on your own? And are you willing to surrender what you do have? So you can watch God do something only God can do. Are you willing to surrender and say, God, I'll give what your word tells me to give. And God, above that, I'll give an offering to help with missions, to reach the world, or reach, to spread the gospel around the world. Are you willing to surrender? Not just your finances, but how about your time this morning? Are you willing to invest more time to tell others about Jesus? And are you willing to use your talents more to tell others about Jesus? I told you about sharing the gospel with Tony's dad. And I'll make myself available to any one of you. If you have a loved one, you have a friend, you have a neighbor that you have been trying to reach for Christ, I'll make myself available. If you want to try to set up an appointment with that individual, I'll be happy to come with you to share Jesus Christ with them. Because there's a need for people to have Jesus If you want to have baskets left over, you got to do what the scripture says. To have leftovers for lunch and for dinner is one thing. But watch the Lord provide with leftovers as we serve Him is a completely different ball game. It's then we will begin to realize just how awesome God is. Let's pray. Father, this morning, thank you for this little lad that gave up his lunch to physically feed a multitude. For the disciples who gave of themselves to distribute. And yet, Lord, within this physical picture is a great spiritual picture of people who don't need physical food but need the spiritual they need Jesus, the bread of life. And Father, today, while not a one of us in this room have much, we believe that when we surrender to you, little becomes much when you're in it. So Father, may you help us today to simply do what you would have us to do and then trust that you will fulfill your promise and you'll open those windows and you'll pour out the blessing and you'll give us basket-sized leftovers. And we'll give you thanks in Jesus' name. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed this morning, 
Do you desire to have those basket-sized leftovers? I know many of you already, you experience those basket-sized leftovers in your life. You know what it's like for God to supply. You know what it's like to obey Him and to give and watch Him just, just take care of you in ways that you probably didn't realize He could do. And give God the praise for that this morning. It's all because of Him. It's not because of us. But perhaps this morning, I don't think recognizing our inability is an issue. I think we all recognize that. But it starts with seeing the need of sharing the gospel and getting the gospel out across the world. And I wonder this morning how many of you would say, Pastor, would you pray that I would truly, truly see the need of sharing Jesus, the bread of life, with people? Would you slip your hand up this morning if that's you? Thank you. Many hands up this morning. As we begin to see that need, I believe God will then begin to move us to say, meet the need. Give the gospel. Give the missions so somebody else can take and meet the need in another part of the world. And this morning, you know your heart, you know where you're at with God when it comes to meeting the need, when it comes to surrendering what you do have to meet that need. And this morning, maybe you just need to commit to God to say, you know, God, today I'm going to surrender what I do have. It's not much, God. Just a couple of little loaves of bread and a couple of little fishes, so to speak. But God, I surrender it to you. And God, I'll start obeying you to give a tithe to the storehouse. And above that, God, I'll start giving and offering to help reach the gospel, get the gospel around the world. If you need that to do that this morning, won't you make that commitment to God? Father, this morning, you've seen the hands that have been raised, individuals who, who, who truly want to have that desire of seeing the need of sharing Jesus, the bread of life. Father, I pray that you'll give us a fresh, fresh vision to see that need. But not just to see it, but to do something about it. To share Jesus. To tell others. To give the mission so that we can help others that are carrying the gospel to places that we're not going. May you change our hearts. Make it true. God, may we become more like you. May you be, continue to shape us and mold us into the person you want, to, want us to be. <clears throat> and we'll give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing the song of invitation in just a moment. But see the need this morning. Maybe you've got some friends, some neighbors, some loved ones that, that maybe you haven't really talked to them much about Christ. Maybe today you just want to bring those people to the altar and say, God, would you help me to witness to my neighbor and list them by name? God, would you help me to witness to my loved one and tell God who they are? God, help me to witness to my coworker and tell God who they are this morning. Help God to help you see the real need of their life and the lives of people around the world. If you need to come this morning, won't you come? Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like
like you. Thou art a potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me, this is what I pray. Change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. We'll give you a few announcements this morning, then we'll uh, get you dismissed. Wednesday night, uh, Bible study, prayer meeting at 6.30, and then uh, Wednesday night is also our basketball ministry. Men's uh, prayer every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. in my office, so I encourage you men to come in a little earlier uh, for prayer time, and uh, we just seek the Lord's face a little bit before we have service, and then uh, been putting that up had that up for a few weeks. Uh, your newsletters are in your mailbox, so make sure you swing, check, check your mailbox, get the newsletter out. It's got some important upcoming dates and information within it. Um, okay, and they took my mouse. Got caught in a trap. Uh, so we talked about basketball ministry. Game night next Sunday. We had a great game night back first Sunday in January. So we got another one coming up. Hopefully those of you that played volleyball, your muscles are back to normal and ready to get sore again. But uh, we'll be playing volleyball again. And then we'll have other folks playing table games in the teen room. And then bring along a snack to share. Don't bring along a big snack. All right, you don't have to bring something for everybody. Just bring a little something that everybody brings a little something. It'll go a long way. And we'll have a great time next Sunday night uh, with that. Uh, men's breakfast up at Mill Run Fire Department for buckwheat cake and pancakes Saturday at the 11th. We'll meet here at 7 a.m. or you can meet right up at the fire hall. If you're going to go to that, let Al know so he can have kind of an idea uh, how many are going to be going. And then we have the love banquet just a couple of weeks away uh, at 6 o'clock. And uh, there are promotional tickets out there you can use to invite others to that. Find somebody unchurched. I've invited like three couples to come, still waiting for one of them to say yes. But I've invited them, trying to make an effort to get unchurched people out to some of the things we have going on. And uh, we've got a great dinner lined up for you. And uh, we've got some live saxophone music being played during dinner and then a speaker as well. It's going to be a great time. See Linda today. She'll be more than happy to take your money and give you tickets for that event. And uh, we'll get closer and closer to it. And then uh, we're back to there. So we've got everything covered this morning. And so praise the Lord. There is a need, isn't there? Amen. But I thank God that he knows how to provide the leftovers as we strive to meet that need. And so uh, God is good. James, why don't you come and close us out in prayer this morning, if you would. Again, first, I want to thank Dan for bringing Sarah. I mean, if you want to get the feeling that I had this morning when I first got out of my car, work with the kids in the back. Because this little girl here, as soon as I got out of my car, man, she come running up and give me a big old hug. Well, just, you know, she, she recognized that I was a teacher in the back. And just to remember that from that, what a good experience. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I, we thank you for what you've given us, Lord. Uh, what a blessing that is, Lord. Uh, we praise you for what you give us, Lord. Uh, me and my wife, Lord. Uh, what a blessing. Lord, I ask you to be with us this week, Lord. Uh, protect us, Lord, and guide us in your light, Lord. Uh, it's all about you, Lord. Lord, I ask and pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.